Hello. Hey, how's it going? Okay, I'm here with Artosis. I'm going to do one of my grilled interviews with him. And obviously, usually when I do them with players, a lot of it will be about the person's career. And so I want to start in a similar way with you. But the, the first place I want to start is Brood War because it, it's, it's rare that you get a chance to talk with someone else who was around in Brood War. A lot of people are very new from StarCraft 2. And so the first thing I want to talk about, not to just jump in or anything light here, we're going to just jump right in the deep end. So when people who maybe didn't follow Brood War very closely bemoan StarCraft 2, one of the things they always say is like, oh, the balance is like always being fucked up by Blizzard. You know, one race is this too strong here. And then they'll say, you know, in Brood War, it was very balanced. And I always think like, well, as a player, I never thought it was balanced. I, mean, I, used, to, I used to play Protoss. As a fan, I definitely didn't think it was balanced because if you look at the history of it, like Terran won so much, then Zerg had a period where it won some, but like, Protoss only really won when people rigged the maps to make them able. Like, there wasn't really balance, but there was some kind of balance. Somehow it worked, basically. Like, what did you think of Brood War balance in that sense? Like, how was it able to work even if it was, was, it, was it actually balanced? Uh, it was, like, balanced differently at different levels. Um, for instance, at the very tip top, I would say probably Terran was slightly the best, followed by Zerg, followed by Protoss. And then, you know, like, the level that foreigners played at, like, Protoss was a bit easier. Uh, than Terran and Zerg because of the mechanical aspects of it. Uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a hundred percent perfectly balanced, but it was so close to balance that, like generally speaking, the better player always won. And uh, as you mentioned with the maps, like you could actually all the balancing eventually was done through maps because we knew what made the maps good for each race. So you would just tweak the smallest things on the maps, like the distance to the third base, uh, the choke types, you know, how big the main base is, like very small things like this. And uh, that, that's kind of how we had it balanced for the last four or five years of Brood War. So, um, you know, it was, it was very good balance. It was more balanced than StarCraft II is right now, but it wasn't by some great margin. And, you know, that's actually where we're aiming to get with StarCraft II anyways, is after Legacy of the Void, can we get to a place where uh, you can get better at predicting who's going to win by changing little aspects of the map? Because no matter how it's balanced, you're balancing it for a certain type of map. You know, if it's a ton of small corridors, Protoss is always gonna win because, you know, just the way the force fields work, for instance, or if it's completely wide open, it's gonna be Zerg based. So in, in the end of the day, it kind of all does go down to the balance of the maps. And, you know, of course, when StarCraft 1 was new, people weren't as good at RTS games in general. So it was harder to figure out what was imbalanced and then fix it later. Uh, whereas if we go back to the beginning of StarCraft 1, it was way more imbalanced than StarCraft 2 was at the beginning of StarCraft 2. Just no one knew it because we all sucked. So, I don't know, kind of a rambling answer, but the balance in StarCraft 2 is really not all that bad. And the balance in StarCraft 1 was fantastic, and I hope and I actually pretty much know we will get back there with StarCraft 2. Because to relate the two games in terms of how balance is thought of, not necessarily like actually implemented, so because people have this imaginary view that Brood War was very balanced, they then, the way they look for balance is in weird ways. Like they'll, they'll pinpoint one unit and they'll try and say, is it too strong, is it too weak? Or they'll look at a win rate and they'll say, is it like near 50%? And they have these weird metrics for how they think balance yeah. would work. But the way I always thought it was balanced, it's like, it's not like it was balanced, but it was like balanced enough. And so you actually said a key point there that the better player could still win. Yeah. And so the, the notion I always thought of is if you really were the, like, the greatest player of your era, you could win on any map almost against any opponent. And so even if it was like your weakest matchup or even if the map actually was biased in theory to one race in overall, I mean, you can think of someone like Xavier where like all the rest of the Zergs had like a 25% win rate on these certain Terran maps and he had like 80%. So the idea is he was just that good, he could win. And so the way I thought you could phrase it is like this. It's not that there has to, everything has to be balanced and there has to be a perfect counter. There just has to be such a wealth of options as to what you can do that then the, the good player can still go to some option that could give him a chance to win. Not necessarily he'll win, but he has the, the opportunity. And this is something where I think people criticize StarCraft too. Like at times, the strategy pool can be a bit linear or the options of what you have to do once something's happened can, can be sort of a few branches, but not, not so many things you can do. Like, what do you, what do you think of this as a concept? Uh, I think it's actually a really good concept and it's pretty accurate. If there's any complaints uh, that are more valid than other complaints, I think it's ones along those lines. Like a lot of people say that Protoss is tied down because of force field. Uh, because the mechanic is so powerful, the units have to be weaker, which 
which forces you into a lot of centuries in the early game, which really dictates your strategy pool. Uh, and there's some truth to that for sure. Uh, and there have been times in StarCraft 2 already where there's one thing you can do. It's like, well, in you know, in Wings Liberty, PvZ, you attack before 15 minutes or you die to Broodlord and Fester. You have to get your damage in. Uh, but over time, we're seeing it rotate through all these things. Like, we were all getting kind of sure that Widowmine, uh, Marine, Marauder, Medivac was a little bit overpowered against Zerg at the beginning, uh, or at least maybe a month and a half, two months ago in Heart of the Swarm. But we saw it rotate into Zerg starting to be tearing a lot, and now it's kind of rotating back. And uh, there's still enough movement in the metagame that... Uh, that doesn't truly exist yet, but I, I totally see what people are saying with it, you know, especially I would say on the Protoss side with the force field really kind of dictating everything that happens with Protoss uh, as far as strategy choice, I guess. So, I mean, it's, it's very interesting and I think it's uh, true, but not, it's not like I'm saying the game's imbalanced or can't be balanced right, but there's truth that the game is harder to balance because of some of these things and some of the harder counters in the game, like, you know, for instance, the immortal, the, you know, the, it's, it's a hard counter unit. So like if you go immortals and your opponent goes stalkers, like you just kind of roll over. But the thing is, we also do have a lot of options like you were talking about before. And people are figuring those out. It's taking some time, and I think Heart of the Storm helped this a lot because we actually just have more branches in every matchup that you can go down. But yeah, it's, it's something that just over time is really getting tweaked. You know, you, people have to remember that because we're all so much better at RTS than we used to be, there's like this accelerated thing where people find something broken and really abuse it and it feels like the game's never going to be fixed. Uh, but at the same time, everyone's so good at RTS that eventually someone figures something out. And, you know, we can talk about balance all day amongst all the pro gamers, the game developers, the fans and everything. Uh, but you have to remember, there's another expansion coming out and the end plan has to be to have that balance perfectly because that's what StarCraft 2 is going to sit on for the long term. Whereas in StarCraft 1, you know, StarCraft 1 was out for a year and Brood War came out and Brood War is what we had to balance. Now, we're balancing Heart of the Storm as best we can so we have a better starting point for Legacy of the Void, but that's going to be the most important part. You also have to remember that there's going to be different balance levels at different levels of play and there's no way to fix that. What we need to do is balance for the very top. You want at the very top for the best balance to occur because when you go lower down, there's infinity things that you can fix. Like if I look at a bronze player, it's like, well, there's everything that you do needs to be fixed and that can raise you up as opposed to racial balance. Like it doesn't matter if I nerf the Hellbat uh, at Bronze League. What you should do is stop worrying about that and work on macro, let's say. And the same goes for Silver, Platinum, even up into Grandmaster. I'm talking about the very top is where balance needs to exist. Like, you may think, well, you know, down here in Diamond, Protoss is domination because it's easier mechanics. You may very well be right, but you can't fix that without destroying the top of the pro scene. I have an interesting theory that I wanted to put to you where I've asked a lot of pros, like in private and in interviews, like what, especially people who've played Brood War and now they play StarCraft 2, like what they thought were like the fundamental things that held StarCraft 2 back from being like as epic as we think of Brood War. And so the problem was a lot of them could say like a small thing here or there, but they could never really get to like what they thought was like a core issue. And actually this Swedish player who was a Zerg player called Lelouch, he's not very famous, but he's like a journalist as well. He actually laid out a really interesting comment that I actually think got to the core of it in a way I've never seen anyone do before, which basically, so it came from when Innovation was going to play Solky in the, in the GSL final, I actually found a... Uh, to, to give people like a taster, I went back and found like an old Brood War game they played that was a really fun TVZ. Oh, nice. And so I showed people it. And then so obviously then people were asking like, well, why is this game like so drawn out in terms of macro? And why does it take so long for things to happen? Because they're used to StarCraft 2 where, you know, like 15 minutes in, people are starting to like max out and they've got like their full army. And then, you know, there's going to be the one or two engagements that end the game. And so he made this really interesting point that he actually thought it's because the they basically basically when they made the workers in starcraft 2 they almost like made them too good like the ai of them and they made them so they like saturate the patches really quickly and so basically it, it led to there being a point where within certain realm within certain boundaries most times nearly all the races would only tend to go to like three bases the max out from there and then from there you go for like your big 200 army you to a population army and you you have your battle and because both sides are going to max out so quickly 
it, it becomes more an issue of like make your army cost efficient versus what your uh, opponent has. Yeah. Whereas when he was trying to describe the, the Brood War style, what was interesting in Brood War was they had what you called like asymmetric balance in this sense. And so in the different, in the different race matchups, Basically, there would nearly always be a case in a macro game where one army would be like that. Like, so for example, in like Terran versus Zerg, uh, Terran would be getting like the really cost-efficient tank army and he'd have the really big army and he'd be trying to like control the Zerg. So then the Zerg instead, because of the way the, the workers worked in Brood War, he'd just like expand more and more and more. And then he'd use his disposable units to hold back the cost-efficient army. And in this way, there was sort of like a parity between the two. Because, okay, you have like much better units than me, like much more cost-efficient, but I, because I expand more, and you're turtling up more, it means that I can then throw more units at you. So it's kind of evens out like that. Again, we've got like both different options as to what we can do at both times. And it also leads the macro game to be like very structured. Like you go to this, then I go to here, and then we know what's coming. And that actually makes it quite beautiful as a spectator because you kind of can see the transition to the next phase. But the criticism people have given me, at least of StarCraft 2, is the idea that you both get to the 200 army, you're both looking for like only a few units that are going to be cost efficient versus that particular army, depending on what it'll be. And so it kind of like limits it a bit more. Is, is there anything to this theory? What do you think of it? Yeah, the theory is actually pretty sound overall. Like I've heard similar things said, like I think Nesty said something along the lines of, uh, and this was during Wings of Liberty, which was actually less complex and less good than Heart of the Swarm, but he said something along the lines of, um, uh, let's see, what was it exactly? I don't want to. I don't want to butcher his quote. Um, it's become a game of decision making based upon what your opponent's done, which, I mean, is always kind of like that has a place in RTS and it should, and it did exist in Brood War, but not to such a degree. Where it's like he did this, I have to know exactly to respond with this right now. Um, whereas the. You know, I think what it is, is in StarCraft 1, it was so mechanical that you kind of ignored that to a certain degree, because you knew what you had to do, that was not the hardest part. The hardest part was being able to do it, whereas in StarCraft 2, you can do it. And let me, I'm kind of jumping around, but uh, the part about the workers is pretty correct. You know, Chrono Boost, Mules, uh, and of course, oh, the uh, yeah, the Larvin injects getting a ton of drones out at once. You do saturate super quick, and once you do hit a certain amount of income, just kind of the way the game flows, you do start maxing out, and you have to be very careful with how many workers you get in each matchup. Uh, so definitely, yeah, you're maxing out quicker and things like that. So I see what people are saying, but I don't see it necessarily as worse. Okay. I don't see it necessarily as a, a problem that needs to be addressed because we are seeing variations in that too. And I think the thing is the variations are gonna be smaller uh, where it's like, you know, with Zerg, you're gonna, it used to be when the Immortal push was big. Get up to your 62 drones and start making units, you know, because that was good for three base economy, you were gonna hold, you would have enough larva. It got pretty mathematically figured out, like against that build, for instance. Uh, and nowadays, you look at it, like Nesty is famous once again for an old quote, like, don't get more than 60 drones in ZVZ, I believe it was, because then you just don't have the right fighting composition. But we do see, uh, peaks and lows uh, in worker counts, in matchups starting to come out. Like a lot of people have talked about the fact that uh, towards the late game, if you have enough orbitals, you start throwing away more SCVs. And we've seen strategies specifically based upon that. Occasionally, it hasn't really caught on that much, but late game, you will see like Terran throw away more SCVs because they do have the mules. Uh, likewise, you'll see drones go up to, what, 100, 510 sometimes, and then go into spines and spores. Uh, as far as Protoss goes, if you're playing like a very scrappy, kind of aggressive harassment style, you might actually go up to 80 probes. Uh, so there, there is some decision making with that. So like, I, I see what people are saying, but I think it's fine. I think the game still needs to evolve a lot, and people have to remember, it is so similar to Brood War that it's easy to be like, well, this is why Brood War is better. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. Like, these are, these are interesting things in my mind. Like, all I do all day is study StarCraft. And to me, these are interesting new problems that we're learning to deal with and learning how to, like, make this into something exciting and cool and fun. Uh, so coming from Brood War, one of the beautiful things about Brood War is because... A bizarre, this might sound counterintuitive. The game is so hard that if you get extremely good, that can make you very consistent. Because you're so, it's so hard that you have extra... There's more room to show that like there's not equality between me and the second best player if I'm like the absolute best player. You know, I can really prove each time I play him, like every time, no, I'm better than you. But in StarCraft 2, 
just looking at GSL, this is like a, take GSL as like the experimental laboratory. The turnover of players can be very drastic. Yeah. I mean, we've even seen it where if you charted through history, almost every champion would either not make it deep the next season or sometimes even drop like to code A, sometimes even to code B, even if they were like incredible champions. Uh, what, what factors do you think contribute to why the turnover can be so huge and why one person can look like a genius one season and next season he, he can't get to the round of 16? Uh, definitely it's a big part of this I think is the skill ceiling because in StarCraft 1 the skills the skill ceiling is so like infinitely high because of the difficulty of the mechanics that like no one was there were occasionally perfect games but not very often whereas in StarCraft 2 like everyone can everyone that at a certain pro level can basically macro super super well uh, and while some players may squeeze out a few more units and have a little bit better economy uh, you know just a, the tiniest mess up in the whole entire world like stimming a half second too early might change you know they were five extra marines into not doing it whereas in starcraft one it wasn't quite like that um, so yeah you know there's it's harder to differentiate yourself right now that's that is true it is definitely harder but we do have some people that have done it like if you look at mvp he's ridiculous he's he over time and time again he's won so many tournaments as has mc uh i definitely have to attribute a piece of why there's such a big turnover to just the fact that these players played so many games and we got to see so many games like if you look at the old star leagues there are just not as many games. People think that this best of one thing is this brand new thing. No, they, they did best of one before. So you wouldn't see as many games. And then, you know, they go up and the finals would be a best of five, not a, a best of seven. And then rounds below wouldn't necessarily be a best of five. They'd be a best of three. So you actually have far less games to study. Whereas right now, uh, like in a format like a GSL or an OSL, you have a ton of games for any champion that can be looked at and completely analyzed. Uh, and you have all these other tournaments that everyone's playing because it's a it's almost a giant money grab There's so many tournaments going on. So That definitely has to be part of it as well because if you play the most games Then coaches are going to look at it pro, pro gamers are going to look at it They're going to put their minds together and find ways to beat you. So it's going to be very hard uh, You know, you're going to have a bullseye on your chest being the the previous season champion and there's just so much information uh, also another thing about the turnover is we had there's because it was so new there was like different jumps in learning uh where people are like okay it's time to stop attacking you know and bam and then all the really aggressive players fall out for a while until they figure that out uh whereas the other group stays in and of course there was always like new players coming into the game from other rts's especially starcraft one and then especially the kespa switch because the kespa pros you know look who dominated in korea when it first started people that came from kespa and that's because they know how to work the hardest uh, they are trained the best they put in the most effort the most time uh, and now that kespa has come over fully we have a huge turnover again which i think is going to last for maybe another year-ish or so until we really stabilize who the very top are and then it should slow down where you see people rotating in and out but it's a little bit more predictable a little bit less hectic because we actually have the most skilled players up there instead of players that just for the time understand what's going on and it fits their style when, whenever you're like someone who uh, since it's your job to watch Starcraft people know that you must watch a lot anyway but I know if you're someone who comes from Brood 1 you're a big fan of the game anyway then there's a certain degree to which like it's just a lot of fun to watch the game because when you watch like a great player it's like awe inspiring the things they can do or like the strategical developments that you see them make when you know the context of what came before and like wow he's just he's perfectly found out how to defeat this one thing we, we didn't know what to do so to, to draw a contrast between the two games Pick out like uh, two or three people from Brood War, any era, where you think of them and you think like, wow, the way they played was just like, it, even to this day, like it blows my mind, like the strategical developments they did were so good. And then pick out a couple from StarCraft 2 where we can say this is like a similar thing, but in StarCraft 2 to kind of like okay. relate your two interests there. All right, so uh, of course you have to look at I Love Oob from StarCraft 1. Um, he he just came along and like he went on a 27 and 0 win streak against Zerg. His macro was out of control. Terran was always a very precise race before him, uh, where you had to just kind of play perfectly, not lose your units, and take your expands the right time and defend them correctly to win the game. Whereas he just made a ton of units. He wouldn't even see just tanks. He'd just attack you, and he just 
he played as if he was like a Zerg and a Protoss put together. It was it was wild. It was for me the most exciting player that ever came on the scene. He changed the game for Terran more than anybody else. I mean, you can talk about I guess you know Boxer and Flash and maybe a few really old guys. Um, but he really he changed Terran into like a macro race, kind of like you kind of see from the other races. So like a very important person there. Um, another one would be Bisu because he straight up revolutionized uh, the worst matchup in the game, which was PVZ. It was uh, very nearly unwinnable up at the top. And again, this is a lot of people thought Brood War was more balanced than it actually was. Uh, there was always a circle of like Terran is kind of good against Zerg, Zerg is kind of good against Protoss, and Protoss is kind of good against Terran. Well, the Protoss Terran one was kind of true, but actually Terran did fine against Protoss. Yeah, yeah. And the Zerg Terran one was kind of true, but Zerg did pretty well against Terran. And then Zerg versus Protoss was actually kind of broken for a long time, where it was like, well, you're going to open up with the two gate rush, and uh, where do you go from here? Eventually, they get mutas and micro run your archons, and you're just like, oh crap. Uh, <laughs> so there were some issues in that. And Bisu came in, and uh, previously it was always like Terran players were really fast, Zerg players were really fast. If you were slow, you kind of just chose Protoss because. Uh, the macro, the mechanics of it were a lot easier. You had less units to play with. You had less bases a lot of the time. But Bisu came in, one of the quickest players ever in the history of the game, and showed what multitasking with specialty units could do to a Zerg, and really helped to revolutionize that by knocking Savior off his pedestal. So, uh, an unbelievably important person. And, I mean, I could name so many people from, uh, from Brood War, but I guess I have to go ahead and probably name Flash, because he showed us what it's like to seek perfection and find it like he he had more perfect games than probably anyone where he would just hit every depot uh perfect macro perfect decisions perfect upgrades perfect timings and just kill you and it was like uh he actually was quoted as saying once and this is the only person i ever believed this with he he said once in an interview something to the effect of uh i understand starcraft completely all that it's up to me to play well enough and i i think that's true because i tell you it, i could watch any terran in the world and be like okay i know what's going on here i understand this oh you made one mistake this game it was right here and a lot of players could probably do that um but with flash like every game you look at and be like oh my god you're just teaching the entire world how to play this race right now because you're completely a step above the second best terran in the world like it's just, you can't really compare you and fantasy or something you're just better so, yeah, those, I guess those three, for me, were really influential uh, in the way that they kind of shaped the game and changed everything. Uh, for StarCraft II, a little bit harder, I guess, because it hasn't been out as long uh, to choose people uh, this early on, but let me think for a minute here. Hmm. Well, I, mean, I guess you have to choose MC to start because Protoss had a pretty hard time. Like before MC, there was, well, the thing is MC was there at the beginning as well. And there were really only three Protosses in the world that were like actually good enough to beat top Koreans. And that was, that was Tester, AKA Trickster. Uh, and that was Genius and that was MC. And Trickster and Genius did well, but MC is the one that like figured out like, okay, this is all about force fields. This is the force field race. Uh, and he would just put on like insane aggression, found out how to utilize force fields. Like no one else really got force fields or how Protoss was supposed to play, be played until we got to see MC dismantle the best players in the world by, you know, force field patterns that we just hadn't really seen yet. Like he'd make double donuts and then storm you and like be done with it. And uh, so he was definitely one of, one of those players I think that you have to talk about. Um, you know, I, as much as I would like to say Nest uh, DRG comes to my mind pretty heavily uh, because he, he kind of showed, like, the power of the Larva Inject really well. Like, he was one of the first ones that I'm, I think of when I think, how did Zerg change completely? It's like, well, you know, you look at some other players, like, Fruit Dealer figured out Banelings were really great when you drop them on stuff and like you got make some ultras to go with it. And then Nesty like just made really great decisions all the time. But then DRG comes along and just doesn't lose anything for a while. Hitting Larva Injects and like maxing out super quickly and doing tech switches. Like 
mass mass roaches force you into ground defense go into mutas and kill you and it uh you know he he stayed a lot on layer tech he definitely wasn't known for teching up more and when you do that you're a very macro based player as well so I think that he might have been, I, people could argue that one, I guess, and I would be like, okay, you're being reasonable, but uh, he's definitely someone that comes to my mind. Um, and I, I feel like I am obligated to say MVP as well, uh, because MVP, like I actually gave him an interview during the beta and of Wings of Liberty, and everyone in the world was like, Terran is so weak. And I asked him, he's like, oh, Terran's the strongest race. And then he went on and just started winning everything pretty quickly. Um, he, he, like, he showed more than things about Terran. He showed the importance of, like, planning a series, uh, which I think is something we didn't see before. And he was the first person that was really, like, planning a series super well. Like, you look at some of the early GSL finals, like, okay, Marine King, USCV, Marine rushed every game. We never went to layer tech. Uh, you know, that's okay, whatever. Um, you know, and I mean, I could go on and on with lists, like even with MC, it's like, okay, MC utilized force fields every game wonderfully. Whereas then you start running into MVP and he's like mixing up different compositions, uh, different styles, just kind of showing what it takes to be that multi-time champion in a game that a lot of people feel you can't differentiate yourself as much in. Whereas he goes ahead and proves that wrong, even something that even I'm like, well, I, you know, it's harder to differentiate yourself in this than StarCraft 1, but MVP also showed that it can be done. So he's, he's pretty important for, I guess, slightly different reasons than the others. So if we talk about MVP a little bit then, the key thing is that you can name a lot of great players in StarCraft 2, but he's the only one who, in theory, gets back to the number one spot each time. So the others might have re resurgences, maybe they win a foreign tournament, or maybe they have a nice GSL run, but he's the only person actually getting back to, in theory, the very zenith, which is like winning GSL. And he's done it time and time again. And even when he didn't, like, okay, so he loses to MMA once, he loses to um, life once. It's not like he's getting crushed by these players they had kind of proved themselves to be the best player at the time so you've mentioned they're preparing a series there are other players who are considered very clever players or very strategical players what is separating him from them in terms of like what he's able to do to come to the top again because i think if you asked a lot of people who are even experts they wouldn't say he was ever the most skilled maybe maybe at one point in time but now there are there are other turns who are very very skilled other players in other races who are very skilled but none of them have this whatever this quality is that lets him just keep returning what is it something is it all in game stuff is it something about him as a person what, what's your take on it that's a really hard question because i i like what you said about he wasn't necessarily the best like you look at his championship he won against squirtle was he the best player in the world right then yeah. absolutely not he was not he was not the most skilled in maybe any way except performing under pressure and planning a series which those are skills but are those directly starcraft skills uh that's you know that's a different question um so yeah it, it's it's hard to say exactly what it is but you know uh what what separates like a true true champion here um well it, MVP can win no matter what, and he will always perform. Like, he plays his best. He plays the best he can, uh, which it's hard to describe why. You know, each person probably has their own rituals they go through and stuff and their own ways that they keep calm and focused. But he plays his best. Uh, no matter what the current perceived balance of the game, he takes it a game at a time and wins. Uh, you know, it looked like PVT was imbalanced when he won against Squirtle. And he just showed that by, you know, placing the right builds and, like, placing a cheese here, which then makes Squirtle, like, a little bit more turtly here, and then going for this and, you know, turtling on this map. And uh, he just, he kind of randomized his play enough. And it's, it's such a hard question because if anyone knew exactly what it was, then we'd just be farming kids to do this. Uh, but he has... He had and he has something a little bit extra where he knows how to win and he stays calm and he executes and uh, more often than not that that carries him through against players with perhaps more skill uh, that some people would call it perhaps more skill. Because this is something when I wanted to, I want to get into some of the more deeper strategical concepts and so a way I thought to get into it was via this topic because 
whenever I think of like in all these sports games I've followed over the years so a few of them actually had like 10 year spans like Quake and Counter Strike and Brood War and so the beauty of having 10 years is that you get to see like the you can just chart the absolute best players and see like the extremes of how they peak and when they come down etc and what I tended to notice was the the absolute best players like the all time greats they seem to have this quality where a good player and a great player initially it looks the same okay they both come along at a period where their style is like in vogue or just it's just the right moment in the meta game for like their particular style they ride it up to the top they win the tournament uh, this is where like the good player and the great player like separate though because what happens is people figure out counters to the style of the good player or maybe the game itself shifts in the meta game so now his style's not as in vogue and something else is better and so the good player now he'll drop off a bit or maybe he'll just just become good at winning the t titles necessarily but the great players can find a way back again it's like they can like reinvent their style or they can identify like what the next thing coming in in the on, along the curve is like what do you think of this topic uh, I think it's completely true a lot of pro gamers get stuck in their own minds uh, where they're so obsessed with their perception of how the game is played and what's right what's wrong you know sometimes what's honorable versus what's not it it's actually when you put it into words like that it's almost like well what are you doing this is your career but i mean it's a lot harder than i'm making it seem right now to actually come out of that but that is the truth for a lot of people and the pro gamers that can keep an open mind and switch styles and i mean we see some like literally this morning uh pult won another big tournament this guy was a cheesy micro based player before and now he's he's adapted himself and he's won reasonably large titles in three different periods of time uh and not necessarily three gsls or something uh but you know we only have a handful of players that have done that anyways um He's someone who can reinvent himself. Uh, MVP is someone like that. MC is someone like that. Uh, whereas, like for instance, is Nest he someone like that? Well, time hasn't quite told yet, but it's a little bit less likely. We haven't seen it. Uh, it's important that people don't get caught up in that type of rut where, like, if you're just a turtly player and you always turtle, even when the metagame shifts, like Terrans are getting too greedy and you're still playing a turtly Zerg style, you know, you you have to you have to switch it up and you have to kind of go with the flow. And the thing is a lot of people, I think this is what the problem is in a lot of people's minds. They think that their way is right. The thing is every way eventually rotates back in. So they hold out and they hold out and they hold out and then it comes back. And they're like, I was right. And then it goes away again and they're like, Oh, I'm just having bad luck or I'm yeah. just not playing as well recently and they hold out and they hold out and it comes back and it gets in their mind they're like no my way is the right way but you know sometimes I just don't play as well and the truth of the matter is it's like well no I mean the styles actually rotate for all three races like what's actually called for to win you have to really pay attention to the metagame to stay on top of that uh, it's it's unbelievably difficult but it's it's something that you'll see in the recurring champions always you'll be seeing that in the recurring champions whereas uh, the people that just peak occasionally normally stay more with their own style because as we get into this topic uh, there are going to be elements of it that will sound more abstract and so i would describe it like this like actually i was surprised to find this once but when i looked up the definition of strategy when I, when I just followed games randomly, I, I always associated strategy with tactics. I thought it was the same thing. But what I read was actually that tactics are supposed to be specific things that you do to execute a strategy. And a strategy is like the general approach, like the concept of what you're doing. And the tactics are like the pinpoint moves that you do to execute that. And so when you think of that, there's obviously two different levels there. The general approach and then how you actually will execute it. But then beyond that, you can obviously go up another level and you could call this like a meta strategy or something. And these things might not even just be applicable only to a game. There might be like ways that uh, ideas interact with each other. And so the way I thought of it was like this. If you're a fan who's getting into this sort of thing, you're going to start at like the base level. You're going to look, okay, what's he doing right now specifically in game? Okay, can I copy that? Can I do this? Then if you get to know more and more, you're going to kind of figure out, okay, what's his actual idea here? How is he conceptually going to win in this scenario? Like he, must, if, he, if his best case scenario isn't good enough, then no matter what he does in game, he's going to lose. And then you go beyond that and there's people who obviously like, that, even though they're playing games, they, they almost seem to have like a genius level understanding of the game. But the problem is when you get to this really high level, you can get to a point where 
you almost aren't even describing it with like words it's like an idea exists in kind of its own in its own world and then you use the words to translate it down to some degree I mean since you're someone who's seen more than one game now and tried to be like as much of an expert as you can in multiple games like how have you seen this scenario happen because obviously the games might seem totally different but then you see there's universality to it, I think what yeah. do you think uh, that's maybe the hardest question I've ever been asked in an interview it's it's so endlessly complex and hard to describe the flow of how pro gaming goes and um, you know there's there's like a lot of universal basics that like kind of apply all the time like in general this is good against that which is in general good against that like a very defensive stance is going to be good against a very aggressive stance and then you have the economical stance which is good against the defensive stance but there's such a flow in between that with like thing is you don't just do one thing this isn't like turn-based games right it's like you have to pair things on and then how do those match against that it's um you know that's that's something i spend a lot of time and effort trying to get better at is trying to explain like basically what you were just saying there uh it's like actually one of the things i really utilize my stream for is i try to like voice these things that i know deep down in my self but I've never vocalized correctly and to actually get it out with the right feeling of what it is because I mean I like for instance when Stardust just won DreamHack while I was watching it wasn't the most beautiful play I've ever seen but I was getting chills because of I I understood the concept of what he understood which was far better than me like infinitely better he understands how to force Zerg to use larva which is what I've way dumbed it down to but the constant pressure like I saw what he was doing and I saw what his strengths and skills were and I was like this is you know this is a beautiful thing but then you have to try to it's it's so complex like every little piece of what it is and I mean eventually as like a commentator and other commentators as well and analysts and programmers ever we break it down into words and it seems a lot simpler than it is but there's a lot lost there so I don't think I'm really truly answering the question, but uh, yeah, that's, I'm not sure what else to say uh, right this second. Like if you want to like re-expand the question or something, because okay. I'm like getting caught in my own mind thinking about thoughts and things okay. right now, you know? No, that's good. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to get into because I mean, we had a discussion before, which is kind of what led to this interview where I kind of made an example like of, of how I think you can frame this topic okay because I'd read in a totally different subject I'd re been reading some Hindu like metaphysics or something and so you'd think well, what does it have to do with Starcraft you know yeah. but someone made this point where they kind of said that this was actually about like spiritual ideas but you could just take the spiritual element out and just make it ideas plain and simple and so their, their notion was that within the mind somewhere the, let's say the imagination an idea would exist but it wouldn't be words and it wouldn't be like a thought in the same way you think the idea would exist and then as you sort of considered it your brain would sort of process the idea and it would turn it into some kinds of thoughts and so the thoughts would have a structure and then when you came to tell someone or you came to write it down you'd then use actual words that were obviously like your native language and that you'd, you'd again you're putting it through another process you're kind of like wringing some of it out and at the end you do end up with something pretty good if it was very good at the, at the top you can get something of value but it won't always be at the end like wait a minute that's 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 good but i had something that was perfect in my mind like this idea was brilliant and when you think of games the reason i think this is a fascinating topic is because when someone is like a great player and they're they're in their beast mode okay they're owning everyone they just seem like oh they just understand they understand in a way that the guys they're being just can't understand mm. and so at the time you think like they're so dominant it seems like well they should never stop losing they should just always they just understand but then you can see when like they they don't they aren't able to translate the next idea or they aren't able to come up with the next element of where the curve goes and then suddenly they just become another player and maybe someone else is doing this to them and it's almost like people think of these from again from the bottom up as though like players just get very good at the game and then they get better and then they yeah. figure out how to beat this guy but there's like something else going on i think in terms of like how ideas interact with like how you actually express the ideas what do you think of this topic in terms of games so yeah that's that's very well said the like for instance i have a, a problem sometimes i try to help people and answer their questions about starcraft and a lot of times people are like in this situation i see this what do i do and i'll do my best to answer it but most of the time what pops in my head i'm like well here's 50 questions based on the game so far uh that all mean something and in fact 
like I remember uh, just something that while you were talking that popped into my mind about it, that is kind of related to that as far as the StarCraft set goes. Uh, way, way back uh, when Protoss was having a very hard time against Zerg, one of those times when that was happening, uh, MC and Stefano played in some sort of IPL match, and I the replays were out, and I watched them all, and I watched them all of them like three times, and by the end I'm like, oh my god, like MC just understands this better than anyone, and nowadays we can go back and look and be like, yeah, these are these are rudimentary concepts, but back then it was like it was so complex, every little piece you saw the like the flow through his build like the way he was doing it what he was seeing and uh it was it was like this beautiful understanding of what he needed to do and this this happens all the time with the very top level players like for a long time and still somewhat now but uh more so back a little bit like stefano was a good example of this where uh you know maybe stefano can't sit down and explain perfectly what he's doing but that's because he's like in tune with the game and what to do and it just I, I hate to use the word feeling because I'm a very analytical guy but it's almost like a feeling like a, a zone that these players get into that uh, you know a certain number of games a certain level of understanding everything just kind of clicks together into and it makes them into like a superman in the game where it's just no matter what happens they read it perfectly there's all these little tiny cues that they're picking up on like and i'm sure a lot of players have had that where they're like that scv moved funny uh oh like a one 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 is coming you know and it's just like this little tiny uh so much of players are expressed through themselves into the game and I don't, it sounds like really epic and I'm not sure that it relates exactly, but like that's, that's what's coming through my head right now is that's how complex it is that, I don't know, I, I, it's hard for me to keep going from here because um, as, as you said, it's like, it's, the idea is in, the, in my head, but then to think it and then say it is, is really difficult for, because it's so much more than just do this against this and have good mechanics, you know? Uh, there's just a lot more to it, almost. It's not mystical or magical, but it's uh, like the speed of your thoughts and your understanding and how to translate those into winning the game. It is it is pretty beautiful to see someone actually hit that level, which we've seen several times in StarCraft Two already. Because I found uh, a way that we could relate this to your, your job, actually. So not just commentary, but obviously your commentary is like an extrusion of your understanding of the game. And so really the way you can be very good in your commentary, sure you can learn the mechanics of how to speak better or how to tell, tell someone an idea better and tell a story, but a lot of like your particular craft is trying to be as knowledgeable as you can about the game and under, understand like how these disparate strategies will interact together. And, and, and the funny thing is, People are always going to give an inherent bias to players and assume because players are very good at the game, understandably so, that that means they understand the game more than anyone else. But we even say, we even see that players of different races clearly understand the game in a very different way, skewed to their race. And they won't understand certain things about a matchup they don't even play, it just, it won't be there. And so, I always, th I was thinking like, the way I could define it is like this, okay, to a lot of players, their way of thinking about the game comes from playing. So they play a lot and then they think about how they played. Whereas people who are trying to be analysts, so they're trying to be experts, there's a degree to which them playing is actually not that important. Maybe a little bit to keep the, the basic skills up, but actually if they spend more of their time studying the game, this is almost like an art form in itself. Thinking about the game is very different to playing the game. Like, what, what do you think? It, it certainly is. Um, it's two completely different ways. And that's not to take away from uh, like playing for understanding because I think there's something to be said for anyone that's been a pro gamer and then tries to become a commentator where they're going to understand some of the more abstract things like practice time, how you feel in the booth. Uh, they're going to understand mechanically, like if it's a certain build where they're doing three things at once, they're going to understand how hard that is and how taxing that is. So pieces like that are very important, but that's not to say that uh, you know, someone that plays all day long and has good results it necessarily every time knows more than like an analyst that doesn't get to play as much or isn't as good. Like, you can see that. Uh, you see it sometimes, you know, the player that cheeses a lot and gets very high, where it's like, well, I mean, yeah, bit by bit Prime got higher in GSL than I ever did, but I would stake my life I know much more about the game than he does. Um, 
And that's not to, again, like the pro gamers are going to understand the game uh, better than commentators on average, I would say. But uh, when you do nothing but study the game, uh, I guess you're a little bit less biased in a lot of ways, especially like I would say I'm maybe slightly more Protoss biased than Terran and Zerg because I play Protoss. Uh, but because there's nothing attached with my Protoss results at this point because I'm not a pro gamer, that helps me personally to be less biased and be able to try to understand the game on like a more fundamental level more. So yeah, it's, it's a completely different point of view where you're trying to find the overarching strategy. And in fact, like Apollo is a very good example of this. He was a pro gamer in a different type of game, never a pro in StarCraft II, a very high level player, but he spent so much time studying the game. And you can see that come out in his commentary where it's like, well, he clearly knows what needs to be done in this situation because he does watch so much. And by watching so much and actually studying what you're seeing as opposed to watching it for fun, like there's a difference between sitting there drinking a beer, eating a piece of pizza and watching a game and sitting there like maybe with a notebook or pausing or going back and like, wait, what, how did he get here? Um, because when you watch a ton, you start to see patterns. Like sometimes uh, if I'm traveling a lot or I just take like a week off for some reason or whatever it is, I feel like I get behind. Like I don't understand the game. Uh, and what I'll do is I will sit down and watch every game for the past week. Like, I will just sit there for three days, watch StarCraft 12 hours a day, and I will take brief notes on what's going on. And by the end, once again, I feel like where I feel I should be, where I've seen the patterns, I understand how the metagame is interacting with each other. Um, so yeah, that's it's something that uh, literally as a pro gamer you just don't have time to do. Like there is not a pro gamer that watches as many VODs as some of the top commentators because obviously they have to play and like the commentator will never beat that pro gamer because they don't play enough. But there's a, definitely a, a level of understanding, a different type of understanding there from what just a pro gamer can give you, which is obviously very good as well. Because I feel like we can even relate this into your personality and the way you've lived your life because like from my own perspective, uh, the reason why it can seem strange to want to study strategy and things like this if you're not a, a, a pro gamer, aside from the fact you can make money from it doing some sort of job, people might not realize this, but there's almost like a, just a satisfaction in just doing it because it becomes like a, like a hobby. Basically, the learning curve initially can be quite hard to know what's going on because it's not always as simple as like, well, A plus B equals C over here. Sometimes it's like, I've got A and B here, but I don't actually know how they interact yet. But then the more you build this up and the more you kind of develop this muscle in your mind or whatever, it, it actually can get to an extent where suddenly like ideas or notions about what might come next almost seem to come like, I did I think that? Like that just yeah. appeared in my mind. Yeah. And so you were saying before, like it can almost seem like a magical thing. Yeah. But I would say you could even like, if you wanted to be like purely rational about it, you could say it's almost like an intuitive element. Like like your subconscious brain is, is working on the idea and then it just pops to the surface with an idea like, oh, here's actually how that could work. And so it's not that you just thought like directly to that course, but then that can be, at least I found like very satisfying because then you're kind of getting things, it's almost like you're seeing the future of what could be in the game. Like, oh, th this could happen later and no one's doing it now, but then sometimes in reality, it'll, ne it'll then happen and you'll be like, wow, that's like a very satisfying feeling. I thought, have you found this yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, I find it uh, both in like, as you said, maybe predicting something that happens in the future uh, and being like, no, I'm pretty sure this is the way this is gonna go. And then you end up seeing it go that way and you're like, wow, that feels good. Also just the study of it itself is really rewarding. Like I brought up before a match in IPL between MC and Stefano and I remember I was having a very hard time because I was playing a lot at the time trying to because that helps my understanding personally um, and I was having a hard time understanding even when I was watching Protoss's win I'm like there's no I don't see any pattern in any of this it all seems very random very luck based uh, there's it seems like no one has a foolproof plan and I remember I, I sat in my little office with like a whiteboard and I was like pacing around watching and like just taking notes and like trying to rewinding and uh, there was like the moment of realization where it all clicked together and I saw the pattern of the way MC was thinking and going through uh, what he knew about the matchup to end up winning against Stefano. And that was uh, one of my most happy moments in StarCraft 2 so far is when that finally all clicked for me. It was like 
almost like an orgasm in my brain. It was just like, oh God, I get it now. Okay, I understand what needs to be done. I may not be able to execute it, but I get it. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, there's nothing wrong with like studying the game itself. It's a it it's one of the most beautiful things. Like StarCraft is. It's like a logic puzzle and art all in one. It's it's a truly something that uh, I gain a lot of a lot of satisfaction from doing. Like even if I didn't have this job, if I was uh, you know just working at Walmart, you know doing just something completely normal everyday job, I would still be spending a huge amount of time playing and studying it just because I see beauty in it and I want to understand it more. So uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's weird. I hope not. <laughs> Actually, the way you describe it there is kind of like a good way to say it. It's like you want to understand it because this is the thing as well. If you're going to go down this route, you kind of have to check your ego and say like, okay, no matter what preconceptions I have of the game or what I already know, if I really want to understand it, there are going to come points where something won't make sense and I have to just kind of accept like... I have to rethink this whole area. Maybe I have to scrap some some cool ideas that seemed to work before they almost worked. And so then you get in this position where I have a theory that I want to run by you. Since you've seen so much StarCraft, you've seen so many tournaments and so many players. So players themselves, for reasons you were mentioning before, it might be the case that strategically what they're doing doesn't work anymore, but they'll always relate it on a very like day-to-day -day basis. Like, oh, well, you see what happened was like, I don't think I got enough sleep last night. And, you know, I've, I've been feeling a bit off recently. My practice hasn't been so good. And really they might have lost conceptually just before they'd even gone in the server, but they're just relating it to like the day-to-day -day thing of like, no, no, that, like I, I'm actually better than my results showed there. And to a fan, again, if they really want that player to win, they're going to look for any reason why even in a loss, he did something good. And then in a, in, a, in a win, it's like, oh no, he definitely, he won that by a large margin. You know, it was never close. They're gonna try and exaggerate a certain side of it. But if you're trying to like understand what goes on, then I have this theory that if you can expand the performance chart wide enough, every single player is almost, almost exactly as good as his overall results. As in, obviously, one tournament or one bracket can go wrong, etc. But if you have enough data, I think you can always draw like a line through and you can find like a, a trend. You can find the patterns, they'll always exist. And so we might not understand right now why someone won a tournament, but if we wait till they've played six more tournaments and then we look at the five tournaments before, then we can suddenly understand why they won that tournament, then why they didn't win the next one and why they came. Like, do you agree with this? Uh, to a certain extent, I, I do. Uh, it's hard to argue with results ever really especially over the long term you look at results like personally i don't like mc's style like it's not a style that i like to play it's not what i like to see i like to see more of a rain style in with protoss but you look at the results like i don't deny mc is the greatest protoss that we've had yet based upon results for sure for sure like and in fact even the korean programmers will say yeah mc's the best he's the man you know he's who you go to he he knows he's he's won so much and this can be said for a lot of players, uh, where, um, yeah, it's it's the results really speak for themselves in that way. But I think occasionally you might get someone that actually has an actual mental block of some sort on how high their skill gets. Like, and the, there's only one person that pops into my mind for this, but I have to bring him up because I think that this this is something that may happen to other people in the future. I don't know how many people this has happened to, but in StarCraft 1, there was a player called Kanata, who's a commentator nowadays. And uh, whenever someone won a Terran vs. Terran Finals, they thanked Kanata for his practice. Uh, but the kid could never make it translate on stage. He had, I don't know what was wrong, but he couldn't do it. He just never, like eventually he started doing okay on TV, but he never hit the level that his practice partners all agreed he was at. And was that nerves, was that something else? It's hard to say because he's a commentator now, so I, was, I mean, if you're talking in front of people, is that you know that much easier than playing in front of people? I don't know. Uh, but I think something like that can occasionally happen. But again, that's the only one that truly comes to mind for me. Maybe, maybe Mind in StarCraft 1, too, a kind of similar thing where it's like, I always saw complete genius in this kid's play, and every Terran and Kree I talked to said he's a genius, and he won only one Star League, which, I mean, that's pretty good, but I don't know. That's, it's, it's a harder question, I think. Um, but overall, I think you have to back up and look at the results. Like, 
you can make fun of a player as much as you want for whatever style they have, but if they've won five, six tournaments and you haven't won one, you know, uh, I, it's pretty safe to say they're better than you when it counts. So this is actually something I can relate to your past, okay, because like I like what I described there, I think you're kind of on this path now of trying to be like just intellectually honest. Like even if I don't like the style, yeah. you know, I accept that it works and it, it has validity and maybe it's even actually more expedient right now than a style I love to watch. Like maybe I like to watch a very beautiful long macro game with certain units, but but maybe that isn't as effective right now. And so it's kind of like you almost have to check your ego a bit like, oh, I wish that my style was in, but it's not right now. But when you were a player, okay, so when you were in Brood War, people, I mean, if, I don't know if you can go back to Svan Team Liquid, but I remember seeing threads where you were flaming people for certain styles or certain pros who were winning. You didn't like how they won. You, you maybe preferred a certain other style that was more noble in a yeah, sense. Yeah. So uh, how has this transition been in yourself then in that sense? It sounds like it's something you've had to overcome yourself. Certainly, without any question. And I still sometimes fight against it to this day. There's definitely, and I think people mostly know there are styles that I appreciate more. Um, like when I mentioned earlier, like way earlier in the uh, interview about, uh, you know, the more honorable style, I was actually speaking of my own oh, brain okay. where I'm like, you know, I like the macro style. I like the longer game because I know that mechanically it's more da demanding. Uh, I know that it's a lot more decision making. And those are things that I appreciate. I appreciate, I appreciate like the logic and good decision making and the mechanics because those are those take the longest to cultivate and over the, the longest term. Uh, like if you look at the Bonejois of StarCraft 1, the guys that really dominated, every single one had in common that they were a macro player except for the very first one because macro didn't really exist. Sure. So it, it just like, that is, if you want to be the very best, that's how you get there. That's what Flash was, that's what I Love Oove, Savior, all the Bonejois were except for Boxer. So that's, for me personally, that's that's what I enjoy the most. Like I, I love Reigns Protoss, he's my favorite. He's turtly, he's defensive he's strategic that's what i like to see but yeah i have to definitely that that was a hard thing to overcome and like when i first started casting gsl i was a zerg pro at the time i uh, still playing a lot i was actually playing the first season and stuff and uh i would actually i said some more negative sounding remarks uh about some of the ways people play it i'm like oh he's just going reapers it's no skill like he's abusing and stuff like that and uh well i mean Still, in some part of my brain, I'm like, well, I was right, but nowadays, uh, you know, since I've become more and more a commentator, and uh, I'm not just looking for results in my own play, like, you know, I still try to play a lot and have as good results as I can on the ladder and stuff, but uh, nowadays it's more about the actual journey to learn as much about StarCraft as possible. Like, that's something that I find more intriguing to me. So. I've kind of, I kind of have to pack away any ego about how I think the game should be played. Uh, you know, I still obviously have very good ideas about how it should be played at certain times, but I've tried to uh, like push that away more and more and accept that I'm wrong a lot. Like, I actually made a rule for myself a little over a year ago where it, at the time it, the metagame was really shifting a lot. It was. Uh, a while before Broodlord and Fester was like the ultimate in Wings Liberty. Um, but I basically, I made a rule for myself where I had to tell myself every three days that everything I knew was slightly wrong. And that was the way that I was dealing with it for a while. I, whatever the builds were, whatever the timings were, uh, I made myself think that uh, the metagame has changed, the understanding has changed, something is different, I have to find what it is. And that's, that's the way that I have gone ahead dealing with it. And after I did that to myself for a long time and always looked for, okay, why should this build not work now? And maybe I go and play that build on the ladder and see what people are beating me with and try to adapt to that. Or I look for that in the games I'm watching. I'm like, okay, he's still doing this build I saw last week. How is his opponent going to beat it? Because his opponent knows about this build by now, right? So that's how I personally have tried to deal with it. Nowadays, I don't have to tell myself physically that anymore because I would actually be like all right everything I know is wrong it just slightly not like completely wrong but you know like I'm like there's new things for me to learn I have to go learn them uh nowadays I kind of do it on autopilot I guess I don't really talk to myself about that as much but because I can see a way to translate this to something specifically that people have noticed in your commentary okay okay so the famous artosis curse like I've always 
my theory I always wondered about was I myself, if I watch a game or a sport, there'll be certain players where their style, I just love it so much. Like there's something about it is so awesome. And it's true that sometimes a player can be the best and have the most awesome style. The two can be united. But sometimes you get a player where it looks so beautiful, your brain tells you like they should win. They just yeah. they just should be the champion. But sometimes they never will be because maybe they, they, their style just doesn't actually, it's not that successful actually in the game or it's very hard to do or something. And you've had all these players where if if we went back in time, you know, this person was going to win GSL or he was definitely going to make the next round. And you've cursed all these individuals. Like, what, was there a component of this? Like, have you, have you reflected on how this happens? Yeah, I mean, there certainly was. And people do forget that I've had good runs as well. Like, okay. uh, like a year and a half ago, right around the time that DRG won DreamHack Valencia. I actually nailed the winner of like eight tournaments in a row and that, that did happen so I'm just throwing that out okay. there but definitely it has something to do with the style of the player and how it relates to me and what I see as beautiful and perfect like um, are there any good examples you can think of where I'm, it didn't pan out but you still felt like you know, yeah uh, all right so for instance Young Hua I predicted to win home store cup he did end up getting the finals didn't win but I picked Young Hua because I'm like, he's playing Protoss right. He's playing Protoss the right way. He's playing a defensive macro style. All these guys are six gating all the time. That is not going to work. Like, this is this is how Protoss should be played. And so, you know, I, I chose him. He didn't end up winning, whatever. Uh, but that definitely has something to do with it. You don't see me as often predict an aggressive player because I always, in the back of my mind, no matter how disattached I try to become, I look at the aggressive player and I say, his opponent should be able to realize he's aggressive. Defense should beat his offense. Defense is the better way to play. And the thing is, StarCraft 1 proved over time that over a huge stretch of time, the, the macro-based player wins more. But on the individual tournament level, it's like, <laughs> it's, I mean, if we, if we go back and look at who, who everyone predicted over the course of t 10 years of StarCraft II, maybe my curse wouldn't look so bad, but definitely uh, definitely my own views on what is the best and what isn't, uh, in my personal opinion, has, has affected these poor players that I really like. <laughs> Because actually, on this topic of the idea of like not necessarily liking a style, but then it proving effective, and vice versa, you like a style, but then maybe it doesn't work as well. I had a couple of examples I wanted to put to you one by one that I think are like extremes of the two. And so, at the moment, there's been maybe for about six or nine months, people have been really piling on Huck because the the you know the stereotype is okay. He just a gates all in or whatever or six gates all in. it's always just like a gateway all in it's we know it's coming at some point and so people try to infer from that okay so he refuses to play the macro game refuses to play long games therefore he hasn't had a really big result so he must be bad and you know all these things like this but what's confusing to me is when i actually look just if i take all of that out of the way and i only look at where he's placing in tournaments he's still having some decent placings he's still getting decently far like in this in this uh, mlg just now he got like decently far for a foreigner like i think he was one of the top two or three foreigners yeah. Uh, he got into that Code S season when everyone said he wasn't going to and when everyone said he was going to do terribly he got through like the uh, up-down matches and so it doesn't quite pan out either way it's not that he's so terrible that he's not doing anything but at the same time he's obviously not playing like the most beautiful style everyone's getting behind and so the reason it, it's strange to me is because people are, on one hand are going to be very down on him it, like in a judgmental way in this sense and yet at the same time they're probably the same people who will tell you how wonderful Grubby is and how even if Grubby loses oh the way he played I loved it it was so awesome and yet actually of those two players if I had to put my money on who's going to play Siren I'd go with Huck yeah. like what do you think of this as like an example because I mean you've, we've watched a lot of this guy's career uh you know you'd you'd come out ahead betting on huck there that is that is for sure and i i see this a lot and i actually do feel bad for huck in this because he has his own style that he plays that he's best with and he performs with and that is gateway all ins like and he does do other things it's not like he never does but uh more often than not when something big is on the line man that gateway like seven gate eight gate nine gate who knows it's coming out uh but you know, he's playing towards his strengths. And I think there are some issues with it because for instance, it's one of the easier things to do. Like if you're in Diamond League and you're looking for a build that's gonna be very powerful and win you a lot of ladder games and make your opponents mad, 
well, you know, a, a six through nine gate, you take your pick, is going to do that pretty well. It's not the hardest thing to execute. You hit your pylons, you warp in, and you attack, and you have a lot of units when they might not expect. Uh, so I think there's like some pre-built frustration because he's playing a style that people don't themselves like to lose to. Uh, people, generally speaking, always do like macro games more. That's not really his MO. Uh, but the thing is, you have to remember, he's actually a very good player. He practices all the time. He's hardworking. Uh, no matter what style he used, it would work out well for him because he puts in the time, he puts in the effort. He oftentimes is living in Korea, playing against the best players with these strats. So he's going to be a level above anyone else with these strats. Uh, so those are some of the reasons. And another reason definitely, just to kind of jump backwards, uh, is when you, it feels like if you know that's coming, you should be able to stop it, yeah. which isn't always the case. Like. Like, I, I could watch 30 Huck replays, right, and know all his timings and stuff, and he might just still kill me with it, right, even though I think I should be able to plan something to stop it. Um, and the thing is, when you do figure out it's coming and you stop it, you make him look terrible. Like, builds like that don't look good when they lose. They look terribly, terribly bad when they lose. Like, how did you even think that would work? And it's like, well... I mean, he does place amongst the highest foreigners. It's just this type of strategy. Uh, it's not going to win you five GSLs. It is going to get you pretty far and allow you to show a lot of skill and constantly get high. But when people stop it, it's going to look bad. It's going to look like you slipped on a banana pill and fell down some stairs because that's just that's the way of it. There's there's not as many finesse situations. There's not as many places where you can make a good decision and try to hold on and stuff. It's like it works or it doesn't work. It's like binary, yes, no. Uh, so yeah, I think I think those are some of the reasons. And he does definitely not deserve the hate he gets for the amount of work he puts in. And as you said, he has. The results to back this up like he he gets deep in all the dream max all the mlgs he, i you can't people shouldn't hate on that it, just because he's playing a style you don't like so the way you mentioned it there was interesting because what you're basically sort of saying is when when it gets hard counted it really does get perfectly solved it makes you look really bad but there's also a degree to which even when it works it's not looking that great because it's looking like oh they were only a second maybe they could have held it off if they'd had one extra unit so it's even when you're winning you're not getting that much credit and so this goes into my next example because this is the opposite so idra so Idra was so extreme about his concept of wanting to play the macro game and it's kind of what we were talking about before, believing like it's bullshit to play all-ins and to play these gimmicky timings. You, you're, gonna, you're gonna win by trying to out macro the guy and like beat him and just, when you beat him, it's gonna look convincing. Like, no, I, I crushed you, I had, I had you in the palm of my hand. And even when you lose, you're gonna have games where it's like, I was competing the whole way and I was close to the end of the game and I just lost because of this one engagement. And so it's kind of the opposite scenario. It's making you look maybe better than the actual result that you have having on paper is and so obviously we know before Idra's retirement like he had this bad spell this really bad spell and this also was the same time when all the other other zergs figured out like okay this infested broodlord composition if we get it at these certain times we play kind of textbook style you get a certain amount of su success it almost feels like if you're if you're at all good and your zerg you're almost guaranteed a certain amount of success so since you know the guy well and you've you followed his whole career and you advised him on some things what do you think held him back in this sense like why like was was there some bias that we're thinking because he's playing macro that he was looking better than he was what was the problem here do you think well i would think the problem with him is what we were talking about a bit earlier where he's stuck in his own mind and uh he really believes his style is superior he's a player that actually learned how to play starcraft based off nada replays and nada was one of like the basically the bone jaw type characters where he was unbeatable with macro and so that gets stuck in your head that this is the way to play and if you grind it out you're going to end up winning like that and we saw uh, him go through the ups and downs that we also talked about earlier where uh he held on to his style and eventually macro starts working a little bit better again and maybe he does gain a little bit of skill and play his best tournament, and then he wins something and uh but it's you can't do just one thing that's that's why he won very few tournaments because his skill was ridiculously high like compared to other foreigners especially the beginning of starcraft 2 i would say he was the best uh but that doesn't matter when everyone knows uh how to put you on tilt uh you know how to disable you how you're going to play before you play these are all dangerous things and it's kind of like 
it's it is the opposite of Huck. Like, imagine if we took Huck and Hydra and like blended them together into one human. What a dangerous player that would be. Someone willing to go with very aggressive strategies and someone willing to go complete balls to the wall macro. Uh, you know, you have to be able to encapsulate all. Just like we were talking about with MVP, you know, he he'll do anything. He'll double procs your axe you and pull SCVs twice, you know, or he'll play the, he'll go three command center off one marine. He'll do absolutely anything and mix it all in together to become a real multi-time champion player. And while, yeah, Idra and Huck both have multiple championships, it's not the same caliber as MVP. And I think a big part of that is they're missing that they're too wrapped up, perhaps, in their own style. Uh, and I, I would say it goes more for Idra than it does for Huck. Uh, it, not always, but, you know, it, the, I guess the way people perceive it. Um, but yeah, this is, and I think it's most pro gamers in the world are stuck on their own style, their own way of playing. And uh, that's, I think that's the hardest thing, though, because you have to do what you're good at. And you, you have to follow your own strengths and whatnot. It, that is an important part. And how to balance it perfectly, nobody knows that yet. Just, I don't, I don't know how to balance it perfectly. I, I guess MVP is the one that we could go to and ask. But uh, how does he continue to have a lot of fun playing? Because I know that Idra doesn't have as much fun cheesing and practicing cheese all day. So I think it's like a complicated question without true answers. And the thing is, people can overcome all these things I'm saying as well. Because again, you look at Huck, he's won like five big tournaments. You know, that's more than most people. Uh, and same with Idra, you know, he's, he's stayed pretty similar on his style and he's won several big tournaments as well. So uh, yeah, it's it's complicated, man. It's, it's kind of like uh, that idea, thought, spoken word. It's like, I see and understand in my brain what this is, but there's no correct way to do it just right. So since technically, as far as this interview is aware, Idra's career is it's a halt professionally, so he won't be playing. So in theory, we can kind of like write the book on it now. And so I wanted to get you to do a bit of conjecture, since I know you know him personally and from Brood War, and you, basically you have a lot of insight into him and his play. So he always used to half jokingly say that the reason why he struggled early in StarCraft 2 was because you told him that playing Zerg was going to be this awesome idea and it was going to work out great. You know, just, just hold off, hold off. Eventually your style's going to work. And basically, it was a long time before the real macro Zerg could be like super successful. So if we ask for some conjecture here, when you look back across his career, did Zerg fit what Idra wanted to do as a player? If he, did, if he does just do like the Kesper pros, okay, he becomes Terran just like he was in Brood War when he's in StarCraft 2. He only plays Terran for the whole history. Like, could it have fit his style? Would he have been more successful? What, what, does, your, what does your gut tell you? What do you think when you think back? I think the uh, Zerg switch was really good for him. Back then, when he switched to Zerg, there were like no good foreign Zergs. And, uh, you know, part of the reason why Idra ended up making a lot of money was because he was famous. And part of the reason he was famous is he was playing what, at the time, when people became big suddenly, was the weak race. Back way, 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 way back, like Wings Liberty Beta. Um, so that I think that definitely helped because if he was a Protoss, he'd just have been another Protoss. We had so many Protosses at the time, so I think that that's an important part to mix in. Uh, but I saw very early on, and that's why I chose Zerg as well, is that Zerg played a lot like Terran in StarCraft One, where it was a very reactive macro race where you focus on defense and crushing your opponent in the long game. Um, and Idra was a Terran player just like me, a macro-based Terran player. So. I knew that this would fit him better than Protoss, because even back then, Protoss was very much about aggression, timing attacks, a lot of gateways, uh, and that's, that isn't what he's known for or anything. So I think it helped his career to go Zerg, but I think he probably would have been happier as Protoss, if that makes any sense. And uh, Terran, I think he would have just been frustrated. So, uh, that's a guess, I don't know. <laughs> Early in your career, people know you played you played Brood War. You uh, you played a lot of it as well, and you were trying to be like a top pro in the in the West. So there was this period in like I think it was like almost like uh, like early two thousand and eight. I think was when you came to Korea. So when you came to Korea, 
people who only followed StarCraft 2 now will look how well how well your career's done and like you're an established part of the scene here and they'll probably imagine oh you must have had like a great offer when you came here or things were all awesome but I've heard these stories I mean I saw them on Team Liquid where basically like initially you sort of just slammed it really hard initially and people forget as well okay so Tasteless was a commentator in Brood War he was doing the Korean stuff for GOM but actually in those GOM seasons in Brood War you weren't, you weren't the other caster you were like here being a journalist and you were doing some events like I know you did BlizzCon and stuff was there really always a plan in place like oh if I'm in Korea eventually I'll get a chance to do commentary like I'll do it with Tasteless did this was there any kind of fortune to how this came about uh, it's actually the opposite um, I came to Korea uh, to basically as you said be a journalist and also do some commentary uh, for a website and my plan was to come over here under that guise and become a pro gamer oh, okay. uh, <laughs> that was that was my goal because it's always like that's uh, I just I love the competition I love to play and practice and try to become better um, and then things just didn't work out when I got over here like I was supposed to have a PC to play on and they just I never got one so I just it kind of forcibly ended my career um, people already really like my commentary because I was a extremely active pro uh, like I just I played all the time watch VODs all the time so uh, I really knew what I was talking about so people liked it from the beginning and uh, it just kind of so happened uh, that I started to become big. Like I was never planning on leaving Korea. I was going to do anything it took to stay here. The pro gamer thing wasn't really working out, but I have to work in StarCraft because otherwise I'm just not happy. And like, even if it hadn't worked out, I would have gone home, worked at Walmart, and continued doing StarCraft until something came up where I could try it again professionally. So yeah, I, I mean, I slummed it and uh, lived very poorly and stuff for a, a very long time. Uh, and the thing is, Nick and I have been friends for a very long time and it, we're both pretty well spoken and stuff. He was a big commentator when I came over. At, people liked me as a commentator a lot at that point already uh, and we were good friends. So we just started doing some things together. Like he kind of uh, helped push people towards hiring me for events like the BlizzCon and stuff like that. And we did some stuff online together. and. Uh, you know, eventually over time, uh, it just, it made sense to continue to commentate. And in fact, uh, I actually quit my job that I had when StarCraft II beta came out, that I had over here the whole time, that I was like just barely making ends meet. Uh, I quit that to become a pro gamer, but then GOM offered Nick and I contracts, which was like solid money as opposed to the little bit I was getting from my team and like having a hard time winning money, so I'm like, well, you know, I, this is, this is solid. Like, I think I have to do this. You know, I am getting a little bit older. I need to have money. And so then, you know, Gom had me commentating so much. I didn't have much time to play and it just kind of happened. It just kind of, not that I'm un unhappy about it. I obviously do love to commentate. So I, I guess it was a, a fortunate thing overall, for sure. So obviously the your famous co-caster is when you do your work with Tasteless. This is like the, the pairing people always think of. So the thing is, the sense that I get from people's take on your partnership goes like this. So both of you love Brood War. I mean, that's a big reason as to why you both took a chance. You came to Korea, you tried to, to become pros or become commentators here. So we go to StarCraft 2, people say, oh, Artosis loves Brood War, uh, StarCraft 2, he's really into it, he's so into the strategy, the players. But then when they come to Tasteless, they say, they're not sure if Tasteless actually likes StarCraft 2 as much. Like, he doesn't seem to be into it in the same way as he was in Brood War. Like, what can you say to that topic? And how do you kind of see your partnership like in, in StarCraft 2 specifically? Like, what, what roles are you playing? Um, well, uh, first, jumping into the roles, uh, you know, I am definitely the analyst, the expert uh, of the two. He's more of a host for StarCraft 2, whereas I guess in StarCraft 1, it, I was still the analyst and he was still the host, but it was a little bit, he was doing a little bit more analyzing, whereas in StarCraft 2, like, uh, StarCraft 2 is my passion at this point, like, Brood War was my passion for a very long time, and now it's StarCraft 2. I, you know, I think... Compared to a lot of people that play Brood War, I see the similarities between the two games, whereas they see the differences. Okay. So I think I have a better mindset to love StarCraft II than a lot of people, because I, I'm like, well, I mean, this is still evolving, this is still a fantastic game. Now, that's not to say Tasteless doesn't like StarCraft II, he actually really does, and uh, Heart of the Swarm has actually rekindled him quite a bit, I would say. Uh, you know, towards the end of Wings of Liberty, I think a lot of people are like, oh, I have had enough Broodlings and Infested Terrans. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, he 
we, we have a great partnership in StarCraft 2. Uh, just as we did in StarCraft 1, we really look out for each other. Uh, at this point in our careers, we're not uh, looking for exactly, exactly the same things like we used to be, like just completely always together, always doing the same things. Nowadays, we've like kind of stabilized our brand. And so like you'll see me do a few more events, like a couple dream hacks here and there where he's, uh, you know, he's taking classes in Seoul and he's focusing on some other things. Um, so we have like slightly different goals than we used to back in the day. Like, uh, so that's, I mean, I guess it's a little bit different than it was, but it's still like really healthy and we're like trying to expand our brands and, um, you know, not just in StarCraft 2, but for instance, we cast some World of Tanks now and whatnot. And that's, uh, you know, it's it's kind of like a little bit of diversification and it's it's good. I mean, we're totally happy together. We're the happiest old married couple in esports for sure. Okay. I always like to end on a hypothetical question. And so the one I have for you goes like this. So I know oftentimes if you're someone who's like an expert about gaming or some of you who's just thought about and you really, you get like kind of jazzed up and you appreciate like great players and how well they play. There's a degree to which you can feel like, okay, mentally, I can kind of relate to that player. Like I'm seeing the brilliant things he does. Like I have ideas sometimes that are really good, but there's obviously like a huge physical component in being a pro player. And if you don't have that, it might never even be possible to be good because aside from just raw mechanics, raw multitasking, even the way some people move a mouse cursor, they, they, they just move it like, like an artist painting with a paintbrush. So some of us just can't draw, even if we have the most awesome ideas. Yeah. So I think a lot of experts secretly wish like, oh, if I just had that mechanical component, like I'd, I'd really show these guys what's up. So in this imaginary scenario, okay, we're gonna have two kinds of technology gets invented, okay? Time travel technology and the ability to put someone's mind in someone else's body. And so you might be able to see where I'm going with this. So we, we sell, tell Artosis, listen, we know you always wanted to be a pro in Brood War. So hop in the time machine with me. We're gonna go back to like 2005, I think. I think that's a good year. And basically, any time from around these years, 2005, 2007, say, you can pick any pro gamer in Brood War, any race, and you think, you, you have to tell me though, which one, if we put Artosis's brain into his body with his physical skills, this would be like the sickest player. He'd really show some shit. Like who, who, who would you want it to be? Who, which pro gamer should we pick for this? I tell you, uh, I wish that there was one where it would be the ultimate pro, but no matter whose body you put my brain into, Flash's brain and body would be better. <laughs> okay. So that's an issue, but... <laughs> Well, what I mean, would really work then? What would the, what you like you know, the way you like to play your style? You know, um, it, it's not a, a Terran player, but Stork kind oh, of okay. in some ways uh, fits that. Like he was so mechanically good, and uh, like obviously I hated Protoss in StarCraft One, so it's not like okay. a perfect yeah. answer. And nothing I could do would beat Flash once again. But um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I would probably combo well with him, or hmm. I could see myself calming well with maybe light alive or someone like that. Uh, just a, a high-end macro-based player because that's always uh, been my weakness is my mechanical skill. So do you have a final message or someone you want to thank or say hello to? Uh, well, thank you for the interview. It's been very fun talking about some of these more abstract uh, concepts. Uh, very rarely do I get to have a conversation like this. I hope it didn't sound too crazy coming out of my mouth because uh, it's hard to like channel that, like the feelings I have about things into words. But uh, yeah, uh, cheers to my sponsors, uh, TTU Sports and I Buy Power, and thanks for the interview.